Welcome everybody to another episode of IGN Unfiltered, my occasional interview series where I have the good pleasure of sitting down with the best, brightest, most interesting minds in the video game industry. Today, my guest to my left is Stig Asmussen. He is the project director on Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Your second appearance, you're in the rear, the rare two-timer club on Unfiltered. Welcome back. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for, uh, you know, showing the interest in the game and, and uh, super excited to be here. We covered it all month, all February long, IGN first, our little sort of cover story thing, trying to bring back the old school magazine, video game magazine days. And uh, as part of that, I had the pleasure of coming down to visit you uh, and play a bunch of the game. And I'll tell you, so April 28th is our new date. I can't wait to play this because I love the first one and and I, I want to get into the second one. But I guess I'll start here with you because when when I was there, a little uh, sort of behind the curtain, I I was it was the, the release date was still March. And then it was shortly after where there was a sort of weird phone call. It was like, actually, we're pushing the game back, but we're still going to just, you know, we're going to go ahead with the coverage, which which was great. But. I'm curious to ask you, the guy that's directing this game, you've got the, the full oversight on everything. What is it like when you have to go to the bosses and ask for more time on a game with A, an already announced release date, and B, this is a big game. This is a big game for Respawn. This is a big game for EA. This is a big game for EA shareholders. Like, this is, it, it is a, it's a big deal. It is a, a triple A Star Wars video game. So like how what can you walk me through that process? Like I have this sort of big dramatic picture in my head, but I'm I'm curious what it's actually like when you have to go and try and get more time on something like this. It's I mean, I'm not gonna say it's easy. Uh, it's there's a lot of painstaking tracking that we're doing while we're making the game and we're looking at, you know, when we're supposed to ship. And uh, that's, that begins day one. And uh, you know, as we were getting closer to the finish line, the whole, and the thing is with a big game like this, the whole thing kind of comes together at the end. And it's, it's exciting, but it's also terrifying. And it was clear to us that if we wanted to hit you know, the quality mark that we wanted to hit and uh, get it as bug free as possible, that more time was needed. Um, luckily, the conversations weren't that difficult because everybody else, uh, you know, my my boss Vince uh, and all the you know higher ups within the organization at EA and Lucasfilm as well, they could see the potential in this game. They could see that um, it was something that people were going to be really excited on, excited about that it was a true evolution of the first game, and uh, you know we made our case, but it wasn't that tough. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it was kind of when we all kind of made the decision, there was a sigh of relief because uh, we wanted to see it. We wanted to see it as good as it possibly could, could be. And we, we wanted the effort that the team put into it for three years to be worth something. Yeah. Um, maybe this is an unfair question to, to put in front of you because I don't, you know, nobody really necessarily has an answer. It's a hypothetical. But do you think that even two years ago, three years ago, that, that you would have gotten an easy yes like this? Because I, I, for me, as somebody that covers the game industry, you know, I feel like, and, and I don't mean to call them out in a negative way, but I feel like Cyberpunk, that release was a, was kind of a, kind of turning point's the right word, but I feel like after that, we've seen publishers, the people, you know, that are, that are signing your checks that, that have to answer to those shareholders a lot more willing to give a game some extra time. I feel like delays, you know, they've been willing to suffer whatever the short-term shareholder quarterly, you know, uh, loss is to, to avoid a potential, you know, really bumpy launch. And again, I'm not saying you, you guys would have had that, but do you, do you feel like that, uh, that, that that conversation that, that would have gone, could have gone differently or would have been more difficult even just a few years ago? I think it really depends on the game. I don't want to, I don't want to speak about other games. I think that if we came to EA um, with the same situation that we found ourselves in on this game two or three years ago and they saw the potential, we probably uh, 
would have gotten the same extension. I think that's, um, I think it helps that we've got it. This game is a sequel and yeah. we've seen like, there's a, there's a real like uh, genuine excitement about and the, the game. first one sold huge. Let's not. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> I think there really were some well. question marks about how, how well it would do, but I, I mean, I, I think you're raising a really good point. I think overall in the industry, yeah, I think that there, that, that people are kind of looking at um, what the consumers and the fans are saying is that they want a quality product yeah. uh, that's released later rather than something that's, you know, a buggy mess that's released like prematurely. And, and so, and pardon me for dwelling on this, I promise we'll talk about more, but uh, it's, a, it's a good conversation. It's yeah, good it's just like I don't often get the chance. Like you're in the middle of this right now. Like you're in the middle of your extra time right now. So it's a it's a particularly relevant topic. Um, how do you land on April 28th out of curiosity? Like because fiscally and again, this is just my sort of, I guess, call it secondhand understanding of the industry from covering it. I'm not in it like yourself, but you know, you're, you're already into a different quarter. Right. So. In a sense, why does, six does it, weeks? Yeah, does why it matter? Weeks, why, to, why don't you just weeks? go to the end of the next quarter and polish more? Like, just I guess if you could kind of help me understand, like how you end up landing on on April twenty eighth. So, when we first started having conversations about extending the date, I was asked how much time, and I said six weeks. That was exactly April twenty eighth. That's that's no joke. That's it. <laughs> um, but we stress tested that date. You know, we looked at what else was coming out around the same time period. And we felt like it was a really good landing spot for us. Yeah. Uh, so we stuck with it. There was an option, you know, you know, do we want to extend it a little bit longer? But it's like, no, we can get it done. We yeah. six weeks. I mean, I'm, I'm actually, I'm honestly kind of surprised that, that you said you look at other, I mean, I guess, you know, of course you're going to look at what other, other, other people are doing, but I feel like you're, you know, I say this with total respect, like I feel like other people have to watch out for your game in this case. You're the... You're kind of the heavyweight that everybody else has to go. Uh, in fact, like, you know, we don't know it for sure, but because they haven't said, but it sure looks like Dead Island 2 kind of got out of your way because they were <laughs> they were already on April 20th. Yeah. And then they went, uh, actually, we can get out a week earlier, which I think is smart of them. So uh, it's it's interesting to me that that you feel like, you know, you've got to worry about other people when you're making a triple a star wars yeah game. You, you 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 never know with the with other games what's gonna be the next lightning in a bottle yeah true and we want to make sure that we've got the clearest runway possible um so you've made sequels before in your career i'm curious what you, what did your years on god of war and, and and the sequels there teach you that that benefited you just rolling right into this project from day one First thing is it's not always easier making a sequel just because you made the first game. Um, it's, you have to control your ambitions because there's a lot of things that, I mean, when we're making the first game, we we're essentially building the plane and flying it at the same time and we had to land it, right? Yeah. Now we've got all this groundwork laid out and everybody's, everybody on the team is super ambitious and there's all these big things that we want to do. And I think to a certain extent, that's what the players are ex expecting as well. So we have to try to manage that. And um, I learned that working on the God of War series. Um, and uh, it was, it's interesting because it was kind of a, it was a relearning, it was getting back on the bike again because when I worked on GFO, I hadn't worked on the first in a series in a long time. It had been probably 15 years. Wow. Um, and uh, for, Survivor was like, well, we're doing it. I'm doing it again. I haven't done it in a while. And, uh, you know, God of War 3 shipped in 2010, and here we are now. So, and when you, when you talk about the, the building the plane midair, are you, I, I assume you're kind of talking about everything, like not just the, the gameplay and like what, what the game is going to be and how it's going to play, but also technically, like, I, had you ever worked, had you ever been on Unreal Engine before? Never worked on Unreal. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that we were up, to, up against. You know, we started, I was the first person on the team and we had to build up to a team of like, I think at, at the end we were around 155, 160 wow. people. Uh, we had to learn a new engine. We, we had to come together as a team. Like most of us had never worked with each other before. And uh, of course, yeah, we're making a, a game on a licensed IP that's like, you know, you know, probably the biggest and most beloved in, in history. There's, there's a, a lot of things that we were doing that were first for us. 
and uh, you know, super fortunate that we were able to come together and, and uh, stay steady and, and see the, the game through. And, and uh, you know, the first thing that, like, while we were finishing that game, we were already talking about what we were going to do in the sequel. When, uh, I, I mean, I guess you look at the timing and it's, it's pretty obvious that Unreal Engine 5, just you were too far along yeah. by, by to, to even consider that for this game. Well, but we did consider it. You did, it's, okay. I, I think it was more, I feel like we had we had the engineering uh, know-how. And, I mean, we, we've got some fantastic engineers on our team that could have solved the problem. I think it was more, uh, it, was, it was new to Epic at the time. So we did evaluate it and we came to the conclusion, it's like, let's stick with what we've got right now and we'll look to, you know, moving to Unreal later in the future. So, so when you saw the this, this stuff that Unreal 5 can do, you know, the Nanite and all these, all these cool uh, systems that it's got, like, just kind of built, baked right into it, as a, as a designer, uh, what were your thoughts just, you know, knowing that you weren't going to use it, you looked at it, but is it, is it something that's, like, really appealing for, for the future? Like, wow, I can't, like, this will be awesome when we get a chance to harness it? Absolutely, but at the same time, though, we were going to a new generation of consoles anyways and new hardware and PCs, so we were, we were looking at ray tracing. That was really exciting. Yeah. Um, we were looking at like more expansive worlds already with greater detail and fidelity, and, and just the game was already like skyrocketing like the technology-wise anyways, so like maybe it was better for us that you know we didn't make that jump I mean, I, I know it was better for us that we didn't make that jump. But if we had, if Unreal 5 was in super good shape and it was bulletproof and, and already devs had already shipped, you know, high quality games on it, um, maybe that would have been too much for us to achieve in the amount of time that we had. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so you talked about the lessons from from making a God of War sequels that you could apply here. What, what were just generally some of the, the biggest lessons from Jedi Fallen Order? That, that you pull into this game, either you know stuff you didn't like, stuff you liked. The most important thing was that is just kind of the process on how we make games, and uh, you know we did a post mortem after we finished JFO where we got the whole team together and we talked about hey this is what's working, this is what's not working, um, how can we improve our communication, our collaboration, um, you know how can we become better as a team? Yeah, and it, <laughs> the thing is is we never really got to execute it on that the way that we had planned because COVID hit, like literally weeks later, and now we're thrown into this new right at, yeah right at the beginning of the project right I guess, at the right because you shipped Jedi Fallen Order in November of 2019 yeah so, and right. everybody's getting back from PTO <laughs> yeah. and, and uh, you know COVID hits and we didn't know how long it was going to last for I mean probably heard this story a million times but it definitely affected and changed what our plans were and we had to reinvent ourselves yeah. to learn how to work in this environment and um, that's something that we're still doing to this day so um, lessons learned that from a production standpoint we I mean it's it's something that we're always learning from and always looking for ways to improve um, but in regards to like building the game it was it was all about we're not going to break what we did before there's things that people really love about this there's things that we love about this so we want to just take what we have done and channel that into new, like basically what, what I would call the 2.0 version, the yeah. evolved version. Um, you mentioned that you were you know, already thinking of ideas, things that you could do for the sequel as, as Jedi Fallen Order was wrapping up. And, and we, talk, we mentioned you know, the sales numbers were enormous. I mean, this game, game did, Jedi Fallen Order did huge. I, I'm pretty sure that you know, whether it's Lucas or whether it's EA, They've got sort of tracking where they, they they kind of have some decent forecasts of that stuff before it happens. I mean, it's not to say that surprises aren't possible, good or bad, but... The forecast wasn't that. It was. I mean, I mean it was, so it was good. I yeah. mean, it's a Star Wars yeah, yeah. game. It's, it's done by Respawn. You know, there was a lot of, like, positive buzz coming out of E3, um, but it wasn't... We did... We far exceeded what, what was expected. So then how, like, how, how early does the green light happen? Like, are you, is, is it before the first game's even done where it's like, yep, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep this train yeah, rolling? Yeah, we were already talking about the second game. We were, I mean, frankly, we were talking beyond. Um, yeah. And the, these are conversations that, you know, when we're 
breaking the story with Lucasfilm. It's like, well, where are we going to go with the second game? Like, I always wanted to see this as a, tr as a trilogy. Yeah. And um, so, you know, how can we take Cal and the crew to new places beyond what we're, we were doing in the first game? And, and we had a pretty decent idea of, like, time frame, where we wanted Survivor to take place, kind of like what the stakes were going to be, um, what the tone of the game was going to be, what uh, Cal was going to be up against and, and, and how the crew was going to factor into that. And, uh, you know, there's, there's ideas of what we could do beyond that as well. Uh, so it's probably safe to say that uh, if, if indeed this series continues, then Unreal 5 is, was a much stronger possibility. I think it's a pretty safe yeah, assumption. Yeah, <laughs> pretty safe bet. There'll be, there'll be plenty of games that have shipped on it by then, and, and Epic will have their tool set all rock solid. So Yeah, I'm not, I mean, it, to do something like that, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy. I mean, we have a lot of proprietary things that we, yeah. I mean, we've warped the engine into just kind of being doing what it does for Jedi right now. Right. And uh, we, we, we would have to, like, kind of retool some of that to get it to work on any new engine. I mean, what, what we've seen as, as gamers in the community of, of Unreal 5 so far, either from tech demos or in a, in a couple instances, actual actual games. I mean, it's pi picturing a, a Cal and, and friends it, in a Star Wars universe in Unreal 5 is a, that would look, that would be pretty sweet. Yeah. So that, that'd, be, that'd be something we'll look forward to. Um, kind of on the note, the technology note, how have the new consoles, the PS5, you know, you are, you are not supporting Xbox One, PS4. You are solely in the new generation. So how, uh, how have these consoles made your lives easier? Or even more difficult, potentially? I mean, more difficult, I think the, the only thing that I would say is that there is imperative with the controllers. Um, I, w I wish there was, uh, that we're, we're designing a game for a different feeling when it's in your hands. Um, other than that, you know, like they're, the architecture is pretty similar. We've got um, the ability to stream things in much faster than we did before with the new SSDs. There's ray tracing capabilities, so we can, for the first, I mean, we've been talking about in my career doing real-time lighting all the time for two decades now. Yeah. And I've never been on a project until now that we've actually been able to achieve it. And that's something that's thrilling and exciting. I think it, it empowers our lighting team to do things and see, see results really quickly. And, and, and uh, it's, it, that's, that's been a, a godsend. Um, you know, we're able to be, be because of the, uh, you know, the, the, the new GPUs and the, the processors, we're able to make larger worlds than we ever could before. Um, you know, as it stands, this game could not run on, on last gen consoles just because of the sheer size and the fidelity and the detail that we're putting into everything. You mentioned the controller stuff. Are you guys doing any DualSense specific stuff? Yeah, we are, but nice. I, I'll, I'll save the details for that. Fair fun. enough, fair enough. We got a little ways to go until launch. Um, so Jedi, this is now, if I have, do I have the count correctly, Jedi Survivor is the third game that you've been the game director for? There's, a, there's actually one other game I was the direct round, but it got canceled. Okay, so. That was at Sony after God of War 3 and it was Got canceled. It was unfortunate. But, yeah, I think uh, we talked a little bit about that last time you were in here. Actually. I believe we did. Um, so where I'm going with that is, do you ever miss the days of, of just focusing solely on art? I'm sure there are sort of trade-offs between having the, the God's eye, 10,000 foot view, vision over everything, and just the head down, I'm going to make the coolest art and the coolest worlds for this game I possibly can. You know, if... If you asked me that five years ago, I, d I would say, yeah, definitely, but not anymore. I yeah. if, if I, first of all, I don't think I'd be very good at art anymore. And, uh, but I think I'm pretty good at what I do and um, I'm comfortable with what I do. And that's, that's kind of like how I approach each day is, is um, you know, this is why I'm here. And this is, this is uh, you know, is, is, if I'm happy doing it, then hopefully I'm doing a good job. So you've You've, you've sort of bridged the, you've cleared the valley between the sort of uncertainty and uh, an unfamiliarity of, of a new job, in a sense, a new role, to now you've kind of, you've got, you've got the experience under your belt for it now. I, I'm, I think my brain is more tuned to taking macro pressure than like kind of like the dialed in, like it's not smaller, it's like if you're, if you're working on a key part of the game, 
there's an immense amount of pressure on that, but it's a different type of pressure. Yeah. And my brain is kind of like rewired to work on kind of like more macro pressure. What, what is directing a game now if, over this, this is the fourth go around for you with it? Uh, what has that taught you about the other non art disciplines of making a game? You know, since you probably, you know, you were so heads down in the art world before. I'm sort of curious now your, how, how your perspective has changed. So when you're talking about other non-art disciplines, you're talking about like... Programming, like, design, etc. I think they're all art. I, don't, I, I think that's... I mean, I, I kind of approach my conversations with any of the departments the same way because of my experience, because we're all, we're all, we're all creating art together. And, uh, but to answer your question in more depth is, is I've learned a lot about audio, I've learned a lot about um, you know uh, animation systems. I've learned a I've learned a lot about code that I didn't know before. I think I had a pretty as an environment artist and an art director, um, and also like as early on in my career as an environment artist, I was also doing level layout and level design as well too. Those tools allowed me to have a pretty broad understanding already of talking to all the different departments, yeah, and uh, you know understanding their 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 needs. And, and how to collaborate best with them. So I already had a pretty good, just from my experience, like I had a pretty good like uh, groundwork established of like how to like communicate with others. But uh, it's, it's every day I go, into a, I go into a conversation, I go in there with like, uh, you know, an open mind and, and try to listen to like what other people, you know, what, what, their issues are yeah. and um, in, in what is their is their goal and try to balance that against the other departments so I don't really weigh any one department heavier than the others it can, because collectively is where we get our success yeah. um, I in in talking to a million developers over the years there's it's always it seems like it's always pretty tough to to let the game go and actually say yes it's it's finished here have it is there is there anything uh, about Jedi Fallen Order that you wish you could go back and change, or is that just what the sequel is for? You know, in the moment, I don't think that there's. I I, I wish we had a little bit more time with that game, um, because I think we could have we it it shipped with some some bugs in it that like we regretted, but we did get it done on time, like we said we were going to. Um, you know, there's there's things that once it went out in the wild, things like we've added like quick travel to the game. We we're staunchly against that in the first game because we wanted it to be kind of like a true Metroidvania right. like kind of approach, and the game was too big for that. And it's when you're so close to it and you can see the the game from beginning to end in your head, you you don't you lose perspective. But when everybody else is asking for it, it's like, yeah, we probably should have done that. Um, so there's there's nothing I can like point at and say, man, I wish we got that into the first game. I'm pretty proud of what we did. I'm not saying you shouldn't have been, by the way. No, <laughs> it's I, just, I, I'm it not does, taking it that I, way. Yeah, a lot of developers, it seems like they always feel like there's oh, there's this one, you know, something that that was um, that they wish they'd left on the table or you know had more time to get to. But it's uh, yeah, that's that's got to be it's got to be almost bittersweet shipping a, a big game like that where you're proud of the team and getting it out the door but like oh if you could have only done that one other thing no because you always <laughs> got your next chance yeah you got and i mean as long as it, as long as you do well you have your next chance and it's i don't feel like it's bittersweet um because when it goes out i mean if it's a success it's not bittersweet because it goes out and you see everybody enjoying the game and you see the reaction that's i mean there's nothing better than that you know is there a you mentioned the exceeding like by a lot sales expectations mm -hmm. on the first game um i'm gonna ask you kind of a personal question here do you do you personally are you able to enjoy that when you see when that when it gets to that figure and you know the, that the original forecast was was good but no but not that like do you are you able to personally enjoy that at all absolutely i mean it's you're talking about I never take for granted what we're doing and the fact that like we're making something that is allowing people to enjoy themselves and have fun and the more people that you can do that that you can touch that way is is immensely um, important is there uh 
does it buy you anything with with the sequel in terms of like because I can't imagine that that your your budget was particularly tight on this game anyway sure. but like but does does that sort of o- over and above success kind of does it does it help the sequel in any sort of meaningful way yeah it does I, I think that there's there's on the first game there was a lot more questioning in regards to hey why are you making these decisions what how does how do these pieces work work together now people can actually see that uh, they could see that in action because we shipped the first game and it was is it was less about you know give us give us regular updates let us know that you're making progress but there was it was no longer about what is this game right so development cycles seem to be getting longer and longer with each successive generation and just as as the years go by uh your team just turned around jedi survivor remotely pretty quickly like relative to what we're seeing from from some other fellow triple a games that are that are four five six plus years um and you've jumped console generations as well like you were talking about so what do you what do you attribute that to like is that that feels almost like it used to be seemed like at two you know you'd expect the sequel in two years now it's like four or five and you guys did it in three uh, across a new console generation as well a little bit what, more than three yeah yeah what, what do you three, attribute three that plus to? four months um I, it's a testament to the team more than anything else I, the testament to you know the fact that that we were able to adapt to working remotely which is not easy and uh it, it, particularly in regards to communication communication and when you're making a you know a game that that the departments have to be in lockstep i mean i it's it's a minor miracle to a certain extent that we were able to to pull it off and and again it's it's i think it we've got individuals that that uh really worked together to um overcome a lot to get us to where we are right now and and um you know, I feel really fortunate about that. I have to imagine that at the beginning, when you know you, you don't, you're all working from home. What the hell's going on? Don't know how long this is going to be, and then it kind of the reality sets in that it's going to be a while. I would imagine there's a lot of cross team talk within EA, but maybe you're also talking to friends and other developers of like what tools are you guys like? Is it Slack? Is you know what project management tools? Like there's there's got to be a lot of just sharing of notes and knowledge amongst the development community at large to try to try and help each other out and get everybody sort of you know full speed ahead in this new unforeseen reality and we're still learning from it right now as well too um yeah i think one of the things i think ea did a really good job making sure that we were prepared and we were able to you know continue working very rapidly um once the who knows how long it's going to take right mode went in and uh you know that evolved over time uh and you know really within more than anything within respawn where we have several teams we're communicating with each other and uh you know from a leadership standpoint we are but then also the the devs on each team are talking to each other uh slack was a major tool that we started using right off the bat and now it's like it's our primary primary way probably of communicating us too here at ign i mean even more so than zoom yeah. Um, you know, you have Slack conversations that lead to Zoom conversations that lead back to Slack, but it's usually always starts and ends with Slack. Yeah. Um, we found ways as a team too to to kind of, I think one of the biggest things that was missing was just kind of that connection that people had of like seeing each other face to face, not talking about the game, you know, talking about what's going on yeah. in the world, talking about, you know, the, the what's the latest show that's on TV or what's the latest other game. Um, and that was lost. And I think a lot of people felt really isolated. And some of the things that we used to do, like every Friday, well, actually back then, pre-pandemic, once a month we'd get together as a team and we'd do something that we call show and tell. And that's where the whole team would get together in a central area where we had like big TVs and um, very free form. People could go up and you know show their latest work and they had a microphone and they could talk about it. And we'd have like food, we'd have like, you know, drinks, um, and people would we'd end the day early, and people could you know see what everybody else was working on. That was lost. Yeah. And um, 
we said, hey, why don't we just start doing that again? And we started doing it over Zoom. And it was a huge hit. And uh, I, I would argue that it's actually better. It's a better format than the way that w we did it before. Um, it's, it's more organized, that's for sure. Uh, but it's, but it's, we haven't lost our freestyle kind of personality to it. But it's, I think it's better because it was needed more than it was in the past. That's a good point. And um, we, we developed another thing, too, that we call the Jedi conversation, which is um, a lot of times people just have questions that, you know, that they want to bring up. Um, and or just have a conversation about how the game is doing. So what we ended up doing is every two weeks we do the Jedi conversation, then two weeks later we do the show and tell and keep that kind of cadence rolling. Yeah. And the Jedi conversation was like beforehand, we'd have uh, a slide out s survey that goes out where people could ask questions and we'd, we'd make announcements and uh, uh, you know general announcements if, if there were any. We still do this, by the way. We just last one was last Friday um, and uh, we would go through all the questions that people asked and then we would just open it up you know does anybody want to ask questions now and like we it truly was a conversation like you and I are having right now it's just that there's there's like 200 people in it yeah yeah I I would have to imagine again even within you got this done in three years entirely I mean we've kind of come back to normal more normal life a little bit here over the last what year or so but would it would i be correct to guess that uh i mean because the pandemic slowed basically everybody down and yep. understandably so so was the original plan to get uh get this game out maybe like last fall like but before the pandemic like the very beginning when you were initially forecasting what, before we <laughs> we knew there was going to be a pandemic, we, we've it, over the course of pr production we track different dates. We have yeah. like our original target. I mean, this was the same thing on JFL. We've mm -hmm. got our original tar target. Then we like after you know major milestones, okay. we we revise that. That's just a standard part of making a game. Makes sense. Uh, we fell very close to like what our original target was. That's I, I was super impressive. Yeah, super impressive. Um, and then what's I know every developer is kind of different. It's still evolving. Uh, when I was down there, there were there were some people in the office. Uh, what's what's kind of the the mode now? Like, are you hiring people to work anywhere? Are you hiring talent like from around the globe? Are you eventually looking to come fully back into office? Kind of what's where's where's respawn at now? So at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought it was good, probably like everybody else. We thought this thing's going to blow over in a few months. Yeah, and uh, when it didn't, people started asking. Rightfully so, people started asking questions. I started asking questions. What are we going to do? This is long term. And the first question is, well, what if people want to move away from the studio? And we allowed that. Second part was, well, if we're allowing people to move away from the studio, why don't we just hire, start hiring people from all, all over the globe? We did that. Um, then the next, next question was, some people want to come back to work now. How are we going to do that? And we started putting together a plan to get people who wanted to come on full time. I think first it was our audio team wanted to come back in full force uh, hybrid. Then they went to full time. They're full time every day now. And then there's uh, you know, a, a collection of other people that wanted to like just be basically pick when they wanted to come in. And we did this, like we had surveys to, to gauge what, what the team's interests were, how they wanted to work. And ultimately we've decided on, it's up to the indi individual. That's great. That's so. that's the best answer right there. That's so great that so really that's you could look at that as a silver lining in a, in a in a un, really unfortunate situation that sounds like I mean your your talent you have sounds like more talent now because it's you know you've got people that that uh, either weren't in the LA area or didn't want to come there. Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and we've got people that have had the opportunity to leave LA, which is an expensive area, and yeah. go to other parts of the country. Or yeah, the world. Um, so I am a player, I will say, that I've, I mean, I've said this on podcast, I'm not a big Soulsborne player. It's just not generally my genre. But to me, I think JFO is, is arguably the most approachable Soulsborne game that's been made yet. Uh, first of all, I guess, would you agree with that assessment that it is, it does sort of fit that, that sub-genre of sorts? It's certainly from a combat standpoint, it is, is uh, definitely an inspir inspiration for us and a touchstone when we were making the, 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 the original game. Um, but we also wanted to have kind of a Metroidvania, which Souls does as well too, yeah. uh, 
very loosely um, Metroidvania approach, um, but we wanted it to be an action platformer as well too. So there definitely are soul roots in it, but there's roots to like a, a whole host of other games. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a mix of different ingredients. Well, on that note, uh, the <laughs> Miyazaki the, showing everybody the, the genre that he arguably created and, and is the best at. Did you play any Elden Ring last year? Uh, I think I've got about, unless I checked like 120 hours or something like that. I'm at the very end of the game. Uh, and I in the last section of the game that I, I think it's the Ash City and I, I stopped playing it because it's, it's, I did the same thing with the TV series Battlestar Galactica. I never watched the last episode. Interesting. Because I don't want it to end. And I'm doing the same thing with Elden Ring. So if that speaks at all about how much I like the game. Um, I, be, I, I was able to beat, uh, is it Melania? The, like, probably the hardest boss yeah. ever. And what I love about that game is like, I could cheat, I could go and shoot a chicken for, for hours, or I could hand <laughs> yeah. my kid the controller and say, hey, shoot this chicken for a while. <laughs> and then I could come back and I'm, I'm powerful now. It's, it's got this adaptive way of like, leveling up your characters, it's brilliant. Did you, uh, do, do you take any notes from from, from an Elden Ring for the future where you're like, oh, this could, something like this could work well in what we're doing down the road? I'm always taking notes. I don't think there's anything that really stands out other than like just, the, I think the, the atmosphere in the game was brilliant. And uh, the, uh, it was so compelling to come back to because it's, it's one of those games when you put it down, you know, an hour later, you're already thinking about these are the things. This is the checklist of things that I'm going to do when I come back to the game. Yeah. And it's so it's like going. The game is working overtime inside your head, and uh, to achieve that is is really something special. Not a whole lot of games are able I, to do that. that. Diablo Four is that for me. I've sure. played the yeah. It's uh, so I I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, what was priority one heading into Jedi Survivor? Like, where you just start? You're starting the project this is the thing we need to do above all else. Like I said, the first priority is that we're not going to, you know, break what we had. And everybody understood that, believed in it. We came up with a guiding light uh, very early that said, you know, this is how we're going to evolve combat. This is how we're going to evolve our pillars, combat, um, our traversal, our exploration, um, and our narrative. We also added a new pillar, which is customization. That's something that we had in the last game. We added very, very late because, again, when I when I said earlier, the game comes together late. You're playing it. What's missing? What do we need to add? Um, and we've realized it's like we don't have anything for the player to get in this game. What do we do? Let's we can do ponchos. You can rock so, new hair for Cal in this one. Yeah. So in this one, <laughs> it's like, all right. The thing that we really felt we landed well on the first game in terms of uh, like uh, rewarding the player was the lightsaber pieces. Yeah, that was a real value uh, customization part in the game, and we said let's do the lightsaber. Let's give the lightsaber treatment to everything. You know the way Cal looks, the way BD looks, the lightsaber. We got a blaster in the game, um, so just many more ways for the players to kind of mix and match the appearance and customize it for how they want the, 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 the player and the experience to be. Are, are you a Disneyland guy? No. Not really? Uh, so well, I was going to ask you if- <laughs> I don't it, like lines. I, 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 I like Disneyland, yeah. but I, I hate lines. I was going to ask if it was a head trip for you that, that you can build Cal, you can get Cal's oh, lightsaber. Oh, absolutely. No, that's, that's incredible. <laughs> that's amazing. Like, it's I mean, so cool. We got to go to Disneyland um, for a preview event at the end of uh, JFO. You might have been there. I was there, yeah. Yeah. Um, and nobody was there. We had the park to ourselves, and that was the that's amazing Disneyland Disneyland experience because no lines. So, uh, but yeah, that the, the, you can't take that for granted. The fact that we've got you know Lego B, we've got um, you know Cal's lightsaber. There's 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 so many things that we've been. I mean, we've been in the te television shows. There's so yeah. many things that like opportunities that Lucasfilm has kind of like looked for for this game and 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 uh you know helped it become relevant outside of the game that i'm hey you're my, canon now man yeah i mean apparently <laughs> <laughs> um before i let you go here what are your favorite star wars games past or present 
X Wing versus Tie Fighter. Nice. Uh, Knights of the Old Republic. There's this other one. It's called Jedi Fallen Order. <laughs> I've heard of it. Yeah, it's it's not bad. It's all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I Kotor for me. I, that game. See this. This is why I like. I'm glad Lucasfilm has kind of gotten back to this. They've come full circle where you know they did everything in house for so many years, and nobody outside of the building would make Star Wars games. And sure, we got some. There was a great run of you know Dark Forces, and you're talking about X-wing versus Tie Fighter. But you know then they then they were smart enough to let like Raven Software make Jedi Knight Two, and and let Bioware make Knights of the Old Republic. And now, but then it kind of all went away again. But now we're back. Now they're smart yeah. enough to let people like you at Respawn make Star Wars games. Uh, and, and they've got, a, you know, there's a few other ones out there, too, from some other external people. Which, which of those other ones that are, that are coming up have, uh, have your eye? There, there's Quantic Dreams game, uh, Eclipse. There's, uh, there's whatever the like, single-player thing Massive's doing. We've got uh, one, too. Yeah. You, I mean, well, Peter Hirschman's... Yeah. First person Which, shooter, I mean, right? I definitely got my eye on that. Yeah, uh, yeah, that I guess you've seen. Yeah. This, <laughs> certainly. Um, I think out of the, those, I mean, they all sound very appealing. I think I would probably. I'm really interested in seeing like a true open world uh, Star Wars experience. So, like, really excited to see what Ubisoft's doing. Yeah, it's, it's weird to think that that's. I don't think that's ever been done with a Star Wars game before, like a full blown. Yeah. Open world, like let's let's go. And people have been asking for it for decades. Yeah. So. Yeah, totally. Um, well, I think we're done. I think we did it. Sweet. Now that all that's left is for you to go home and finish the game. Go back and work on the game. Yep. April 28th, for sure this time. For sure. <laughs> we're going to do guaranteed. it. guaranteed. Um, it is so, Stig, it's so great to see you. Thanks for coming up here. Thanks for having me again, Ryan. Yeah, Stig Osmussen, the game director on Star Wars Jedi Survivor. It is out on Xbox Series, PS5, and PC on April 28th, uh, other games are already scooting out of your way. That's, that's just how it goes. Uh, we're looking forward to playing it. For more uh, from the best, brightest, most interesting minds in the games industry, check out all the other, I think, 60-something episodes of IGN Unfiltered. We'll see you next time.